Hey, good morning, everyone. We're uh, going to uh, continue in our book, uh, or book of Jude series. So I encourage you to grab your Bibles open and follow along. I'm going to read the whole book again um, this morning for us. So uh, it would be great. It's not up on the screen for us this morning. So please grab out your Bibles to the book of Jude. We're going to uh, read from the book of Jude now and then pray. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, to those who have been called, who are loved by uh, loved, loved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be yours in abundance. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write to you about the salvation. Uh, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. Though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their bodies reject authority and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Yet these people slander what they do not understand and the very things they do understand by instinct, as irrational animals do, will destroy them. Woe to them. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. These people are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict them all of the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These people are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus foretold. They said to you, in these last times, there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These are the people who divide you, who follow me in natural instincts and do not have the spirit. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy, mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray before we jump into our second week of Jude. Lord God, uh, this text has been um, kept uh, for thousands of years, maintained, retained, and determined by the very earliest Christians to be a way in which you have communicated your will to us. We believe that this is your word, revealed to us that we might know what it means to follow Jesus. And even though at times it is a little unsettling and confusing and overwhelming, Lord, we ask that as we sit with it, as we listen, 
that you will speak to us, that you will shape us, and that you will find us faithful to respond in whatever way you are calling us to do so. So we ask that you would be with us this morning, speak with us and move amongst us for your glory and for the blessing of our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, back in the, uh, the 1990s-ish, uh, a phenomenon sort of spread throughout, particularly office blocks throughout the world. Motivational posters. Do you remember those uh, posters up on the wall uh, where there might be a, a, a photo of some majestic mountain or an eagle flying high above and, and some word and then a quote underneath that was designed to inspire you to greatness and to, you know, wonderful accomplishments in your life. And it was particularly popular in, in workplaces throughout the 90s. Here are a couple of examples. First one, dream big. Your attitude, not your aptitude, will determine your altitude. How good's that, hey? Whoa. Repetition, alliteration sort of stuff, Zig Ziglar, leadership guru, that's, that's great. Who would not be inspired by that? What about this one? Challenge. Always set the trail, never follow the path. Doesn't that just make you feel like you want to conquer new worlds? You, you know, don't, don't be one of the crowd, lead the way, that sort of thing. You know, so that was, that was a, a big, um, does everyone remember those sorts of posters up on the walls? You know, we've seen them before. Well, after they had been out for a number of years, some bright spark with a dark sense of humor and finely tuned sarcasm turned the tables and started producing demotivational posters. If motivational posters were designed to uplift and inspire, demotivational posters were designed to bring people back down to earth with a healthy dose of reality. For example, this next one, potential. Not everyone gets to be an astronaut when they grow up. Everyone might dream of being an astronaut, but the reality is that most of us end up doing something far different than what we may have the lofty dreams that we had. Not that there's anything wrong with serving fries, okay? Any young people here who are considering what they're doing in the future uh, don't see that as being a negative or, or terrible thing. Serve fries, you can do it in a godly uh, way with integrity through that, right? So don't misread that. But the truth is the brutal reality of life is that we may have these dreams when we're young, but they don't always work out. Next one, motivation. If a pretty picture and a cute saying are all it takes to motivate you, you probably have a very easy job. The kind robots will be doing soon. Not much to say about that. Uh, but my favorite, I think, of all is this one with a picture of a shipwreck. Mistakes. It may just be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. I think that's ultimately the, the, the ultimate demotivational poster to say that your whole existence may be wrapped up in heralding warning to other people of how not to live life. Now, of course, no one should ever feel that way because each person does have a wonderful purpose and that is clearly revealed in the Bible. But this is, uh, is seeking to be a counterbalance uh, to the, the, the notion that, you know, every single purpose, uh, person has, you know, a world-changing purpose and, you know, all of those sorts of things. It's a sense of which we also need to be held to account sometimes and brutally reminded that we do make mistakes uh, and sometimes um, other people can learn from them. Well, this book that we are currently looking at, The Letter of Jude, is one big demotivational poster, in a sense, showing the ways in which the shipwrecks of others throughout history warn us about the present challenges we face each day. Now, you'll remember from last week that Jude is warning about godless individuals who have slipped in amongst the community of believers. He says this from verse 3, Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in amongst you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality 
and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. And we looked last week at uh, the, that concept of turning the grace of God into a license to just live however we want. And he says there, there are people amongst that group, that church he's writing to, who look and sound like Christians. They've secretly slipped in. They're not obvious but who have taken God's grace for granted and turned it into a license to live however they want. And later on in the letter, Jude says that these people are hidden reefs in the Christian community. They shipwreck a church. And so in order to warn the church he is writing to about the dangers of these godless people, Jude offers a series of historical examples that serve as valuable lessons. Essentially, his desire is that they would learn from the mistakes of others. And the reason he lists the examples he does is because they are all different expressions of taking God's love and goodness and turning it into a license, a freedom to live ungodly lives. Firstly, he looks at the people of the Exodus. In verse 5, he says, though you already know all this, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered his people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. Now, Jude is bringing to mind the greatest story within the history of Israel, the way God rescued his people after 400 years of slavery in Egypt. He sent, you know, the 10 plagues, he parted the waters of the Red Sea and allowed them to escape Pharaoh's army, and he led them to Mount Sinai on the way to the promised land. It's the most celebrated act of protection and provision of God for the people of Israel. They celebrated it year after year after year for thousands of years, celebrating God's goodness to them. But how did some of that generation who were released from Egypt respond to that great gift of freedom? Well, in Exodus 32, we hear that when the people at Mount Sinai, saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. So God brought them up out of slavery in Egypt in order to take them to a wonderful future. But before he could even give them instructions on how he wanted them to live as his people, they made a golden calf to worship instead. They gladly accepted the freedom that God granted them. They said, brilliant, you've brought us out of Egypt. No more slavery. Ha ha. But you're taking a little bit too long to tell us what that means, what that looks like. So we'll just mosey on our own way into a different, into worship of a different God. We'll, we'll celebrate, we'll grasp hold of that freedom, we'll go off and live in a completely different way. And by highlighting the consequences that came to these people, Jude is making the point that God is not someone to be trifled with. Yes, he's abundantly loving and gracious, but he is also no fool. We can't just accept God's grace and then continue to do whatever we want and think there will be no consequences. That's a scary message, isn't it? But Jude saying, learn the lessons of those who have accepted God's grace, his mercy, his love, his provision, his protection, all of those sorts of things, and who go off and treat that with contempt. Jude then goes on to give the example of the fallen angels. He says in verse 6, and the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now, this verse almost certainly refers to the fall of Lucifer. And the third 
of the angelic beings who went with him, as explained by the prophet Isaiah and expanded on by Jesus himself. Now, the issue that these fallen angels had was that they were in the heavenly realms with God. They had roles of authority under the headship of God himself. And yet, despite this, lusted for more power and influence. So much so that they were willing to leave God's presence and move into the darkness for the lure of power and glory for themselves. They weren't content with all they had in the heavenly realms with God, and so deliberately turned away from God in order to gain it. And once again, there were consequences. And then thirdly, Jude references another historical situation to warn his readers. This time, it's the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. In a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer the punishment of eternal fire. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah is presented in Genesis 18 and 19. Now, there are a lot of assumptions and misunderstandings that arise out of this story, and we don't have, unfortunately, time to do a deep dive into it today. But what we see in this story is two towns that had become so vile and evil that there were no limits at all to their behavior. And it wasn't so much what they were doing that they were condemned for, but rather that they just took whatever they wanted, regardless of the wishes of others. There was no such thing as consent or respect or boundaries, right? Whatever they wanted, they took. Whatever they desired, they just did, without consideration for their fellow human. And God sees that these two towns have become so corrupt that he intends on destroying them. But Abraham pleads with God to show mercy. You see, his brother Lot lived in Sodom. And so he pleads with God by arguing that there must be at least some righteous people in the city. And if God destroyed the city, then he would be killing innocent people along with the guilty. And well, that's just something a just God wouldn't do. Clever argument. And so as they debate together, Abraham gets God to agree to not destroy the cities if even as few as 10 innocent people live there. There might be thousands of horrendous people, 99.99 repeater evil people, but even if there's just 10 people, God agreed that he wouldn't destroy it. And as the story goes on, we see a disturbing encounter where the people of Sodom have their minds set on committing an horrendous act on others against their wishes. They are given the opportunity to turn from that to a lesser evil. Still evil, by the way but one that at least involved a level of consent and would have equally satisfied their ungodly desires. But they reject that offer and choose still to pursue the more evil option. So in essence, God's, God shows grace by relenting and agreeing not to destroy the city. They are given the opportunity to escape the destruction that they so deserved they are given a way out, handed to them on a platter, and yet they reject it because they just want more. So three historical examples where people turned the grace of God, the mercy and loving kindness of God, into a license for immorality and just living the way they wanted. And they suffered the consequences. On each of these occasions, we see people receiving the grace of God and yet abusing it so they can keep on living the way they want. They didn't take God's grace seriously, nor did they treat it with the honor and gratitude it was due. And so they paid the price. And as Jude goes on in verses 8 to 11, he points out 
that the people who had slipped in amongst the church of the time were doing the same sorts of things. They were falling into the same sorts of mistakes. And in verse 11, he gives another three rapid-fire historical examples. He says, these people, woe to them. They've taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error, and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Again, three significant historical situations from various parts of the Bible that each have their own profound lessons within them. One about jealousy, one about greed, and one about a lust for power. But from Jude's point of view, they are all examples of what happens when individuals who know God's grace let their guards down and allow disobedience to creep in and take over their lives. When they gleefully accept God's love and mercy, but fail to take his call to obedience seriously. And it starts them down a road of walking away from God to a point where they become apostates. People who say, I don't believe anymore because it's easier for me to deny God's existence than confront the disobedience in my life. Now, that is a significant difference. That's a significant road that people have walked down throughout history, not just the people in Jude's time. Now, we need to be careful here. Jude's not suggesting that once we become a Christian, we must live perfect lives. That's not his point. The warning he gives and the examples he implores offers us to be people who don't take God's grace for granted and who live with a deep sense of gratitude for his kindness. People who take a response of obedience seriously. You see, God doesn't expect us to be perfect, but he also doesn't take kindly to us accepting his grace and treating it with contempt. Make sense? That's Jude's warning here. Likewise, we shouldn't condemn one another for not measuring up. The church has been good at that, but we shouldn't condemn one another for not measuring up. But also, Jude's saying, we shouldn't let each other off the hook and justify one another's ungodliness. We shouldn't turn the blind eye to what's going on at times. We need to keep each other accountable. We need to spur one another on to what it means to love others and to obey Christ. Sadly, the church across the world has been known to do far too much of that, turning a blind eye to disobedience in our own midst. You see, we're known for talking about ungodliness out there in society, but not taking it seriously enough when it occurs in our midst. We justify it, we overlook it, we sweep it under the rug. And that, as much as anything, is what our society has issue with. Yes, it's abhorrent when things like abuse or scandal or fraud happens within churches. But it's when it's covered up and justified that's not only so infuriating for the world watching on, but so damaging to the faith and lives of those who suffer as a result of that ungodliness. Many people have had their faith shipwrecked by other Christians who haven't taken sin seriously enough in their own lives. As a church, we need to understand what it means to be people who take sin and disobedience seriously, but not in the way that so often is the way it ends up, where we take sin and disobedience seriously outside the church in people who aren't Christians, but ignore it within our own lives reverse that. That is where our witness should be in this world, where we take it seriously in our own lives to say we are called to live lives that are transformed by the grace of Jesus, by the Spirit of God, that we would be taking 
living lives of integrity, of honesty, of generosity, all of those sorts of things. We should be taking that seriously ourselves and stop pointing the finger at the rest of the world. And when we do that, we will have a far more powerful witness in this world. But too often it's the other way around. And they look at us and go, why on earth would I bother with that? So Jude uses all of these mistakes of the past to offer a warning to the church, both the church of his time and the church today, to be on guard against an attitude that would compromise on holiness or justify ungodliness within the community. He's drawing our attention to the shipwrecks that reveal the hidden reefs that threaten to scuttle the church and sink either our own faith or the faith of others. We're going to finish in a moment, but as we do, I'd like to just take, uh, like us to reflect on what we've explored today, not just from the historical sense in that, you know, there's plenty of examples that, that Jude has given throughout scriptures, but I'd like us to to contemplate the shipwrecks of more recent times. See, Jude has shown the value of, observe, of observing the shipwrecks of the past in order to avoid making the same mistakes. I wonder, do you know someone whose faith has been shipwrecked? Someone who used to follow Jesus, but who now no longer believes? If you do know somebody who used to walk with Jesus, but who now denies him, denies God, has no relationship with God, I want you to picture that person. And I want you to ask yourself, what led to that? For some, it will have been a circumstance which has left them hurt or angry with God. Maybe it was the behavior of others that has caused them hurt or trauma. Maybe the, the hidden reef was another Christian who has scuttled them. What is there for us to learn out of that situation? For others, it will be what Jude has been talking about, where they've compromised where they've justified ways in which they desire to live the way they want and ever so gradually have walked away from God. Whereas I said before, there's one little justification for living this way and we move that way. And then I justify something else that I want to do that I know is not quite the way God wants me to live. And I just justify it and I gradually take a step. And it happens week after week, month after month, year after year, until my life I know is not what God wants, but it's now easier for me to say, I don't believe in God, than make the step back to change my life in repentance and humility. That's why a lot of people end up over here, not necessarily because some amazing event has happened to cause them to disbelieve in God's existence, but because bit by bit by bit, they have compromised and justified disobedience in their life to the point where it's easier to say, I just don't want God part of my life anymore. And I'm sure many of us know the stories of those whose faith has been shipwrecked in that manner. And Jude's warning is that if we allow these hidden reefs to sit amongst us, covered up and ignored and overlooked, and we think that they're not that serious, what can happen is that it shipwrecks our faith and the church. So I want you to reflect on that and just ask yourself, what lesson? If I know someone who's gone down that track, if I know someone whose own faith is a warning. What lessons do I learn from that? How can I make sure that I don't 
follow that same path and end up where my faith is also shipwrecked. Take a minute or so to reflect quietly with your eyes closed and bring these lessons before God and ask for his wisdom and for his Holy Spirit to help you live out that wisdom in your life. Poggy's just going to put some quiet music on for a minute or so just for us to reflect and think. Thanks. As your scar, you pulled me from the Lord, as Jude has pointed out, there are plenty of people throughout history who have let their guards down, have allowed themselves to take your grace for granted, and who now find themselves far from you. Firstly, our hearts break for those we know and love. And so we ask that you would once again demonstrate your grace to them and reach into their lives to draw them back to yourself. Secondly, we don't want to be people who end up shipwrecked ourselves or shipwreck others. So Lord, give us wisdom. May you find us faithful to be guarding our hearts. And may we encourage one another to contend for the faith and pursue Christ-likeness in all we do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, well, as you've probably discovered over the past couple of weeks, there are reasons why Jude's letter isn't particularly well known outside of the doxology at the end. <laughs> it's heavy, it's negative, it's unsettling. And so we usually avoid it. Uh, but despite this, it does serve a very important purpose, for it reminds us of the importance of being part of a church community where we can encourage one another, warn one another, look out for and protect one another, and constantly spur one another on to live lives that give due honour and thanks for the grace God has shown us. That's what we'll be looking at next week as we finish our series on Jude on a much brighter note. <laughs> You'll be glad to know.